I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design, with a conversation about art, public spaces, and a look at the future of design events. Is this thing over yet? I was invited to moderate a virtual conversation recently. It's, it's really interesting how something like a virtual panel, which felt so foreign four months ago, now seems normal. The new normal has affected every part of our lives. One really amazing such new new normal, and, and I'm using the, the heavy air quotes, the new normal, is how we engage with art in public spaces, how our design events will emerge once permitted to resume activities. And, and then there's the way art has become a source of comfort for many and a source of protest for others. That second part is something I found particularly interesting, and I, I think you will too. A pandemic wrapped up in a social crisis, the likes none of us have ever seen before. This conversation covers a lot of ground, and it explores the role art plays in our lives now, and how it will play a major role in the healing process. This panel was organized and produced by Christine Anderson, of Communication Arts and Design, featuring uh, Gaston Isoldi uh, from Maison AFJ, Wendy Posner from Posner Fine Art, Juan Espina from Hoffman and Espina Landscape Design, Evan Snyderman of R and Company, and Sandra Vlock of Studio Vlock. Thank you, Christine, for putting this together. It was really interesting. It was really enjoyable. It was thought provoking. And um, it was a little challenging. It was a lot challenging. And um, those conversations make for some of the best episodes. And I think this is one you'll enjoy. Convo by Design is presented by Walker Zanger, a fantastic company and an equally fantastic design partner. While the Walker Zanger brand was built on the promise to inspire designers and architects to do their best work, there's far more to it than that. Yes, that promise is fulfilled every day through a commitment to provide the best ceramic, glass, stone, porcelain, and concrete surfaces and finishes. But at the heart is a family-owned and operated business that provides stunning surfaces for a well-designed home and does it to make designers and architects do their best work for their clients. Walker Zanger started in 1952, and they are absolutely one of the best trade partners a designer can have. Check out their newest collaborative line with designer Pieta Donovan, a collection of cement and ceramic tiles inspired by the patterns and colorways of the 1970s and created with a comfortable modernity. Walker Zanger is on the cutting edge of design, featuring products for every style and architectural feel you can create. And they provide homeowners with the materials that dream kitchens and baths are made of. Check out any of their 14 showrooms across the country or shop online Walker Zanger. Dot com. We're going to uh, introduce you to the panelists themselves. A couple of notes first is, again, my name is Josh Cooperman. I'm the associate publisher and online uh, editor for Interiors California Magazine and host of Convo by Design, a podcast for the design trade. After this, um, we will be publishing the audio uh, from this conversation to Convo by Design. So if you want to hear it again, that's where you can find it. And I know that Christine will also uh, have ways for you to view it again um, after, this is, after this is done. If you have questions as we go on through the conversation, we're not gonna to go to question and answer at the end, but instead um, we would encourage you to go to the bottom in the chat feature, type in your questions so that we can have them asked and answered in real time. Very excited about the, the following conversation about art, nature and public spaces. And I think it's important to note that, and we're gonna to get to this, that this conversation was ideated probably about six weeks ago. And since then, the world has changed not once, but twice in numerous ways. And um, it's sort of changed the narrative. And we're gonna get to some really interesting ideas and I hope you enjoy them. First thing I wanna do is sort of go around the panel and have them introduce themselves to you. And um, Wendy, you and I go back the longest, I think. I'll start with you. Terrific, thank you so much for everybody uh, participating on this esteemed panel today. Thanks Josh for hosting and moderating and Christine uh, and 
for putting it together with her team. My name is Wendy Posner and I'm from Posner Fine Art and we are a fine art advisory and we're based in Los Angeles, California. We work with private clients and we also do a lot of work with corporate uh, real estate developers. We're working a lot within the hospitality industry and also with uh, landscape design and architects. Sandra? Hi, uh, so I'm Sandra Block. Uh, I've had a long uh, career as an architect and much of my work has been in the public realm, uh, libraries, museums and galleries, and a lot of university projects. And while these uh, building types have been reimagined and reinvented uh, dozens of times, the consistent point for me and the thing which brings me to this panel and now working as an artist is the importance of gathering, just people being together, uh, social connection. And uh, I'll just as a, as a quick little note about how I uh, segued from architecture uh, for over 30 years to working as an artist, I designed a, uh, a birthday gift for my brother that was not giving him yet another sketch that sometimes would be framed or sometimes would, I don't know where it would end up, but it was a fireball. And the fireball was actually a repurposed, very large antique steel mooring buoy. And I had this idea that I was gonna turn it into a fire vessel. But the key here is that while that would have been really interesting and cool, if not risky, I designed it to be in my own hand, my own style, um, illustrative style. And it was very narrative based. It was about his, my brother's love of coastal Connecticut marine environment. And I mentioned this because it became really a template for me to focus on the things that really matter most uh, to me in my career as an architect. And especially now, it seems so incredibly uh, valuable where people just simply want to gather and to feel connected. And this is really what I am doing um, in sculpture. And uh, also most recently working uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, in Southern California where the outdoor environment is so hospitable to art in the landscape. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Juan? You just Spina. muted yourself, there you go. My name is Juan Ospina. I'm the principal landscape architect at Hoffman and Ospina Landscape Architecture. Uh, we're based out of West Hollywood, California, and also Spring Branch, Texas. We do work around the country. Um, so we do have two offices where we focus on hospitality and high-end residential with selective commercial jobs, uh, to say the least. We strive to work with our clientele who do have a high test taste in uh, art and my partner and I and our team do work collaboratively to find locations work with art in nature um, make it a part of the experience of a garden so I am on this panel uh, as the landscape architect who um, sort of guides people to uh, locations in art sculptures and art gardens um, so we, we, we focus on how to channel people to certain locations uh, in a safe way. Um, so we are on this panel talking about a few things. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into it, but, but we, we do see it as a landscape architect from a different perspective than the artist, uh, where we are looking at vignettes and how we see it from different angles, the terrains, the slopes, how we get you to and from. Uh, so I look forward to sharing some of that knowledge today with the panel. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Gaston? Yes, my name is Gaston Isoldi. I'm the director for the Americas for the show Maison et Objet in Paris that takes place uh, twice a year, one in January and one in September. Thank you, Gaston. And uh, last but not least, Evan. Uh, hi, my name is Evan Snyderman. I am the co-owner and founder of R & Company. Uh, we're a design gallery in New York City uh, specializing in historical and contemporary design. We represent uh, both sides of the design world and really are focused on the sort of deep historical uh, significance of design. We do a lot of publications uh, on the designers we represent and also um, trying to preserve the history of 20th century design specifically. Um, in the gallery in New York, we have a vast library 
an archive that's open to the public um, when we're open. <laughs> uh, and we, we built this library for the sake of uh, research and discovery, which is one of the things that drives us as uh, dealers. Um, I personally was a uh, artist, a, a conceptual artist and a performance artist before I started my gallery. So um, one of the things we look for in the designers we choose to represent are the really uh, sort of avant-garde, let's say, or the radicals or the people that really push boundaries and blur the lines between all of the, the arts uh, and the media out there that, uh, that, that help people be creative. Thanks, Evan. And you know what, I, I want to go right back to you because one of the things you said is <clears throat> when we're open which almost seems like a throwaway line to some, but it's really not. And it goes back to the point that when we first started talking about this conversation, you know, we were at the very beginning of the pandemic and it was a health issue and it was gonna change the way that we do business. Then society changed dramatically and violently all at once. And it's necessary change, but with necessary change, almost to uh, Sandra's fireball concept, you know, when things change, you were directly, I think everyone has been directly affected by this in one way, shape or form, but you were directly affected by this. Two galleries, um, you got hit in New York through civil unrest. Tell, tell me a little bit about the experience and specifically how due to these situations, you have to sort of pivot the way that you're doing business now. Right, well, <clears throat> It was uh, certainly a big, you know, uh, shift that we had to make. I think in many ways we're fortunate in that we are a private gallery and we can, we can be agile and we can make significant changes very quickly when need be. Um, and we have been through difficult times before. My gallery is located about nine blocks away from the Trade Center. So mm -hmm. after 9-11, we had a major shift we had to deal with. Um, and of course, we've been through the 2008 financial crisis when, again, we had to revisit how we did business to try to survive. Um, and <clears throat> I think a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, being creative and being open and being uh, able to, to kind of change course quickly. So, of course, we've been affected. The galleries officially closed, I think, March 13th. Um, but we have found new ways to continue to stay engaged with our with our clients which is something that is key um, to keep dialogue going conversations going between clients but also between all the artists we represent who are also uh in this at the same time we're worried so of course are they on how things are going to transpire over the course of the next who knows how many uh months so you know we were able to shift to you know creating online exhibitions um, and how, and we started to create uh, sort of talks, Zoom talks with artists and architects and friends and collaborators to kind of keep these sort of conversations going, let's say. And, um, and that's been surprisingly fun and, and actually relatively successful in, in the sense of, you know, we're going forward and things are moving forward, although at a, a much different pace. Um, we still don't know where things are going to land or, you know, it's a little bit of a, a juggling act knowing, you know, can you reopen the galleries? When does it make sense? And this is a whole huge conversation of how are things going to change? Because obviously things will not be the same um, for any, any foreseeable future, nor in many cases or many ways should they be. I think this was actually, you know, in some ways an opportunity for us to make significant changes to the industry, to the way we do business, to the way we think about things, which maybe was a much needed break because as everyone in the art world and everyone on this panel obviously knows, things have been moving at a great, you know, great breakneck speed for the last 10 or 15 years for most of the, the people in the art world and the design world. And um, it was almost becoming, you know, unsustainable in terms of how things were happening. So. So maybe it's now time to reevaluate all that. I, I think that's, those, are, those are great points. I will tell you, um, I have not heard the word fun used in describing 
recent events in a long time and it's very refreshing. So I think that that's fantastic. Wendy, um, Evan brought up a, a number of points and I want to go to you, you know, Evan in, in particular. Now you, it's sort of the, the art space in general, you see, you see a lot of changes. What, what is changing? What does this look like going forward? Well, I think that first of all, you know, when uh, the lockdown first uh, started, one of the things was to really evaluate and talk to different people within our industry. So we spent the first eight weeks really having dialogues and conversations. The first shift really started with the cancellation of Art Basel in Hong Kong. So that was back in January when China was just really, you know, sort of at the peak of the COVID epidemic. And from that, all of the galleries had already shipped all of their art to Hong Kong. They already had their teams in place to go to Hong Kong. And so the art fair had to really pivot very quickly to be able to keep their exhibitors intact, as well as all the art collectors who would normally be traveling at that time to go to the fair. So that was one of the first sort of eye openers that, you know, if travel gets shut down, and so much of our arena was really predicated on this art fair circuit uh, all over the world, month after month, and whether it was a art fair or design fair, uh, that that was going to change because travel was going to come to a stop. So how are you gonna then reach your global target audience? And from that and the conversations we had with the different galleries and all the way down to our art uh, shippers and art handlers, you know, we started to see that this is not going to be the same on the other side, that the retail gallery space, the art fair space, all the travel was going to shift. And it maybe was for the best because the overhead and the expense of traveling and doing all these different events is quite costly. So we started looking at different ways that art could be uh, exhibited. Uh, whether it was in the virtual space and or in a public space, because there was still the opportunity going back to the sort of premise of our conversation today about social distancing. And one of the things that people I think miss from all of these different in events is the social engagement. And so as a potential art collector or someone who's interested in art, Right now, you can go and view a lot of exhibitions online, you can visit museums online but you're still doing it as a solo person. So you're not having the same kind of contact that you would if you were going to actually a gallery opening. So how do you recreate some of that environment in a safe space, which would be outdoors in a public space? And so it's looking at how do you take exhibition programming and moving it outdoors and having social engagement safely. Uh, but then also looking at, you know, we're seeing pop-ups of drive-by art fairs, drive-in movies are coming back. So it's changed sort of the ideals of exhibition programming. In addition, I think the advancement within the art industry, as well as that the technology wasn't being utilized to its fullest, where in interior design and architecture, there were certain technological applications that were being utilized for even doing renderings, 3D, CAD, uh, showing virtual showrooms and things like that that was being implemented, but it wasn't being done within the art world. And now we're seeing the art world sort of transitioning. And it started with the onset first of private viewing rooms, which are sort of micro sites of a gallery, which could be a part of an art fair and or exhibition. But now we're seeing it taken into a 3D space and while some of it is still sort of fundamental and rudimentary, I think that through the situation with COVID and this lockdown, it's really been a time of innovation. And I think that art world needed a little bit of a shakeup, and this is a perfect opportunity to explore some of those new arenas. Thanks, Wendy. I think that's great. And, you know, it's funny, the, the next logical step from, from that is really over to Gaston. You know, you, you produce one of the iconic design trade fair events in the world. And I'm just curious, you know, looking at this, you talk about a pivot and you talk about changing things and you talk, how do you do your event in this environment? What, what have you, what is the process you've gone through and are still going through um, with the, with the, the current state of and future of the, of Maison Objet? Well, basically, uh, Josh, no, we, we take, you know, 
some parts in consideration. We have no different parts playing in, in an event, as you all know. Uh, so we have no, the most important part is you know, from one side is our exhibitors and the other one is the buyers. So we have in each edition 3,000 exhibitors and 80,000 visitors coming from all over the world. So um, that's the first thing that you know, we have to take you know, these two in consideration, plus the government, not only the government in France, but also the governments elsewhere. So we have to, uh, considering that you no, know, they can probably have a quarantine coming into France or when you get back to home. So, so those are the things that we we considering. So, the logistic part right now, uh, for example, for September, we took a decision um, just a couple of two weeks ago uh, to cancel the show in September because of that. Just, you know, we wait until the very last minute just to make have, have more clarity in the horizon, and and then we said, okay, no, we we have to cancel it. Having said that. Uh, going back to uh, one this point, you know, we create uh, a digital fair that will take uh, place in September from the 4th to the 18th. And, and we took advantage. The good thing is that we, we have already the, the platform. So we, we developed a platform like four years ago and we invest you know, several million dollars to create that platform that's called MOM. Um, so we have a marketplace already in place. The only thing is that we have to adjust a few pieces to get it as a format for uh, the digital fair. And that you know, we just announced it yesterday, officially. So that will take place in September from the 4th to, through, through the 18th. Having said that, today we'll already open the registration for the January show, which takes place from the January 22nd through the 26th. And, and going to your question is, you know, we have to consider many points to create a safe environment um, for that show, you no know, physical presence uh, in Paris. Um, they show it, you no, know, it's, it's a massive show. As some of you that, that doesn't know, it has uh, a 1 million 300 square foot footage of uh, just only stands. So it's, it's huge. So you have to take care of now working with the government. We are part of the, we are leading the group of trade show organizers in France to create jointly with the government all the measures, safety measures that we have to have now in all the trade shows in France. And, and that's going not just only for the show, but also public transportation. No, our show is outside Paris. So we, we rely mostly in the public, public transportation. So we need to know having that in consideration in order to move the people from Paris to Vilpon. And and from there, no, we have to redesign the entire show, which means no wider aisles and, and no, obviously sacrificing some stand spaces because no, we need to, and, and that is no redesign the entire floor plan and having no more security checkpoints in all the places. And, but having said that, we don't, we don't have to stop the flow of the people. So we, we passed through that and, and certain point in the checkpoints with you know, the terrorist attacks that happens in France a couple of years ago. So, and then you know, we, we, we work on that as well. And uh, the terrorist attacks happened in November and we had the show in January and we, we exercise very quickly how to do it and work with authorities. So right now we're doing the same thing. It's like, you no, know, right now we are doing first, you no know, this digital uh, fair in September and working very closely with the authorities and also with our exhibitors to make sure that we have a, a safe and successful show in general. You are listening to Improving on Nature, and we're going to get back to the conversation in just a sec. But first, I wanted to, uh, to share a new design resource with you. Not new. It's actually not new, but uh, it's new to the show. So I wanted to share. Top designers know this. If you are going to get to the top of your game and stay there, you need strong partners. You hear me talking about partnerships all the time. I've spoken to enough amazing creatives to know that teamwork and strong partnerships are invaluable. Bassman Blaine is a multifaceted home furnishings company with a passion for helping designers do their best work. They represent some of the finest vendors on the planet, and if you are a design professional in California, Nevada, Arizona, or Hawaii, you need to let them help you find the perfect pieces for your projects. Strong partnerships start with a good conversation, and I want to encourage you to start one now with Darby Cooperman. 
An absolute pro, if the last name sounds familiar, it's no coincidence, Darby and I have been married for 28 years. So I know her and I know that she can help you. So email Darby, Darby C, D-A-R-B-Y, the letter C, at BassmanBlaine.com. Let her help you specify products for your amazing designs. All right. And tell her I said hi. Okay. Back to this great conversation about art, events, and the new normal. It's really interesting to hear you explain this because nothing, nothing kills the experience like logistics, right? And unfortunately, that's where we are today. And so I'm curious, you know, going over to Juan, to you for a second, talk about, talk about landscape and nature as canvas. And specifically, as we talk about less opportunity for, for people to go out and experience because we have to have social distancing and to Gaston's point, you know, I'll, you know, you have checkpoints in some places, you have security measures you have to take. It lessens, it does, it can lessen the experience. And then there's the whole idea about taking these exhibitions and making them virtual. When you talk about a, a landscape experience and nature, there's so much to it. You know, it, it, you have all five senses working at the same time. How do you approach landscape, nature, and trying to get that experience in whatever sense and being, and knowing that you have to be as flexible as you have to be right now, what's your approach? Well, thanks for the question. It's uh, got a, three parts to it, uh, but as far as landscape and nature and how we deal with the public uh, is sort of for, for us is a, is a primary user and the public safety is a primary user, uh, is how to and get from A to B in a landscape. So the logistics of a design in nature correlate to all of the things that we're talking about. We have set standards uh, in our industry, construction industry, for widths of walkways, appropriate risers, appropriate space for 70 people. And we have calculations within the standards that allow us to have a flow of 800 people in three hours. How many people can you get with this width of, of a walkway? Um, so I think the standards uh, now are going to be sort of changed because of all the new COVID restrictions, our six foot social distancing. We've always talked about private and personal space in our industry, but now it's even further uh, distance. So it is going to be a challenge in, in keeping everyone uh, playing by the rules. As, as you can see in different parts of the world and different parts of the country, there's a lot of misconceptions of, of what the virus is and how effective it really is on the outside or indoors. A lot of people are now pushing people outside because they feel that airflow is much better um, to, to, to sort of delegate uh, the issues of the pandemic but they're still there, they're still on the outside, they're still on surfaces, which we also have to be concerned about. So um, how to get people to do to an art exhibit being safe in a, in a format where we're all on the same page, I think are, are critical points to consider. You can see it in supermarkets where we have one ways to flow. And as long as sort of everyone follows that, maybe it's a possibility, but you could just see by the logistics Gaston was discussing, we're facing that in every industry, just in construction in general, how to move products from A to B. There's a lot of logistics that are, have, are altering our, our, all of our experiences. And the virtual experience is one thing, but I think people are, 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 are needing and craving that exterior experience and I think we can do it, like Wendy was saying, drive by fairs and, and, and maybe, maybe there's a little bit more opportunities to consider that, um, to, to, to have maybe longer uh, drives where we can see the artwork uh, until we figure out and resolve the issues. Um, but I think the virtual versus the, the reality are, 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 are far by different because of the wind, the smells, the the, the vignettes that you see when you're standing in certain positions as opposed to a virtual where you can't feel or smell or touch. Um, so I, hopefully we, we can find uh, standards that would, would be suffice for, for us all, Josh. Sandra, to that point, and as an artist, um, has this changed the way you view 
your work? Has this changed your creative process? Has this changed the way you want your work to be seen? Has it changed the, what you do? Rather, let me re-ask the question. I know it's changed. I'm curious how. Well, I almost feel like I, I've arrived at a perfect moment in terms of what I have been most passionate about. And, um, and I have to say um, that it's a, we have to make a shift in, in attitude and perspective about whether or not this is uh, social distancing or physical distancing. And I think if we look at it as physical distancing, just as Juan was describing it, we're not gonna have uh, uh, sidewalks that are suddenly six feet wide or, or, or wider. I mean, we're kind of stuck with some of these design standards, many of these design standards for the long haul. So um, in terms of what I do, what I think about um, both as an architect and as an artist is as Juan was describing, this choreography of the experience. And I'm trying to think of it in terms of um, uh, you know, a very positive social gathering experience or connection to nature. I design things which by and large are to be uh, uh, part of a, of a place, creating a sense of place, creating a destination. So um, being in the outdoor environment is, um, uh, is natural to, to the work that I'm doing. I've kind of extended my thinking about how the art experience and a sense of connection to nature or, or narrative can find uh, new and interesting places that hadn't really been thought of before um, or maybe not as creatively. So uh, a, a recent uh, idea that I'm pursuing is the design of shade structures where it's an opportunity like a, uh, like streetscape, street artists who just find a blank wall say, well, that's a good spot. <laughs> I'm kind of looking around at how can we introduce and, and integrate the art experience, the communal experience. It's not just art. And I don't mean to say it's not just art, but this sense of a shared, uh, a, a shared experience, a, um, a way to connect people through, through uh, an artful form. Um, these are the things that I'm exploring. I, I mentioned the first um, piece of a, a fireball or fire vessel that really surprised me, um, the impact that this had, where it, it went beyond the functional of a fire pit, and it so engages people. And, um, and I think that that's uh, in the context of our conversation now and uh, the importance of, of uh, making a pivot and a change. I think that art can really show the way, artists and creative people can really show the way in a very positive uh, form. I, I love that and I love the segue and I want to sort of lead into something. What I'm going to do is, Wendy, I'm, I'm going to actually start with you on this one and then what I'd like to do is, is just make this an open forum. So please comment as, as you see fit because I think it's important. I think it's really important and we had this conversation um, briefly when we all spoke the second time, between the first time we, were, we gathered and the second time we gathered, there was a massive protest that everybody watching is fully aware of. Something really interesting came out of that that's not a, it's not a first, I, is, the, is the, the sense of expressing oneself as all artists do through their work. And I think everyone who's here, as well as everyone who's watching this, has seen the George Floyd mural. Mm -hmm. Everyone's seen it. I first really noticed this. I've noticed this, you know, growing up in L.A. in the 80s, I, I, I saw the, the rise of, of street art, right? But I've never seen it before to the extent when Kobe Bryant died. The, the murals of Kobe Bryant and Gianna popped up around the world. I've never seen anything like it to that extent. And, you know, Wendy, you and I have had this conversation about public art before, and Sandra is, mm -hmm. is talking about it here, just sort of how the experience of experiencing, bringing in, viewing, and, and um, emotionally connecting to art, public art, right now, especially being locked down, everyone feels like this is never going to end. 
this particular one's going to end. It will most likely happen again in the future, but if this one's going to end, we will be back to some sense of normality. And I'm curious, Wendy, you know, you're very familiar with the art world and public art in particular. Sort of talk about this concept a little bit and how you think that's changing the, the art, no pun intended, but the landscape of art today. Right. Well, I think that going back to the fact that, I mean, you know, what we've seen, you know, over the last month, month and a half, is all the political art that has been being displayed throughout cities, not just, you know, nationally, but internationally. So, you know, with the Black Lives Matter and with the protests starting, that it was an opportunity where different people, whether it was tagging and or actual murals that were being painted on the sides of buildings, it became an opportunity to express and to also to a show of certain respect or a certain political point of view. And you can see historically throughout time that during times of like turbulence, change, political upset, that it's a great way and it's, a, it's an opportunity for artists to be able to get to really be uh, completely unfiltered, I think at this point. I think that we've seen the rise of a lot of very interesting artists presenting very intense political information and material. And it's something that's very raw and is unedited. This is not something that was a curated exhibition. This came from the people for the people and by the people and to be able to experience it on the streets where everything was happening is why it's so poignant and really important right now. Evan, how do you, how do you take that experience and format it, conform it to a, to a virtual environment, because that's kind of what you need to do right now in, in your world. How do, you, how do you blend the two between art and experience? That is a difficult thing to answer. I don't know quite <laughs> honestly how to do that myself, although of course we, I think it has to do with, with conversations and, and in dialogue, that, that is the, the closest thing um, you can get to. Obviously when, when uh, we can eventually do private viewings in the gallery, as we're already starting to do, we'll bring back some of that experiential work. But, you know, I think that the bigger topic that Wendy was talking about that we're getting to is this, this, uh, you know, the, 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 the bigger changes of how, uh, you know, the, how to deal with systematic racism and how we're going to deal with that in the public space. Right. Cause that's going to be a huge shift. And I think, how we were talking last time, we kind of had this almost like a new WPA kind of concept coming. Maybe there's like, like Black Lives Matter might represent a new era of, of a kind of larger scale public art program where statues need to be replaced by things that represent different communities in a different way, which will be really exciting for the future of art and the contemporary scene that we, you know, we all exist in. I mean, in, in New York City right now, of course, it's going to be really interesting to see when the dust settles and things start to come back. I mean, they're just starting to come back a little bit now, but you know, if you go through Soho and all the windows of the stores, which are boarded up are covered in, in graffiti and in artwork and murals and wheat pasted posters. I mean, it's actually really beautiful. Um, you know, this kind of public art we haven't seen since, since the subways used to get painted. You know, if you go back through the 70s and the 80s, I mean, I was in love with, with subway art. I mean, the, the way that the trains were painted uh, when I was a kid, why can't we do that again? I mean, that was such a beautiful display of creativity. And if you thought about that as an opportunity, the, the MTA, which is $7 billion in debt, took that as an opportunity to try to, you know, get some major artists or even unknown artists and street artists to come and paint those trains again. I mean, there's a whole, like, it, there's a lot of opportunity is what I think is, is what it comes down to. Obviously, it's a, it's a long road, you know, long road ahead of how to, how to change those things because a lot of it has to come from, uh, you know, governmental changes, um, which is, you know, we can, but, but certainly we can all do our part in the art world to, to start this conversation, to start those, to make those changes. The, the little changes we can make will have a bigger effect down the road. So what we're basically trying to do now is figure out what we can do, what we can contribute, how we can make a change and how we represent artists and who we represent and why and, and that sort of thing. 
Can I just make a comment on that note? There's a there's a couple things, you know, you know, Evan, you're talking about the graffiti and street art, you know, that happened in the subways, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And it's interesting, a lot of those artists ended up becoming very renowned and sought after artists that ended up moving from the streets to yeah. like more traditional art formats and mm -hmm. becoming very successful. So I think that there is that transition into commercialization of that work, which is interesting. And yep. you look at, I mean, even with like land art installations, uh, there is a fine art biennial that takes place in Palm Springs in the Coachella Valley, which was started in 2017 called Desert X. And artists went out and like selected different locations and different sites for the creation of site-specific work. And the success of Desert X was so interesting because there were an opportunity for people who never had engaged with art to all of a sudden come and see art in a natural landscape. And it was overwhelmingly successful. And it was almost like geocaching for art. I mean, so art can create conversation. Art is something that not everybody is going to like what they see, but if it sparks or piques some sort of dialogue or interest, then that's part of the thought I think that goes into it. So it's interesting to see the transition, you know, from some of those more traditional settings to utilizing, you know, non-traditional settings. Let me just add something to what you're saying. Um, and Evan, um, just thinking about curation, mm -hmm. it's so important to have that historical context. And we're all looking for that. We're living in an historical moment. How do we, how, how can uh, you as a, as a gallerist bring that uh, headset really to, to the rest of us who are maybe encountering um, uh, art in a, in a new and public space? to see this as being part of a continuum? Yeah. Good question. Um, <laughs> that's, 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 I mean, that's what we were working on, exactly. I mean, how to curate, you know, more, I mean, all, all of our exhibitions, we've always been very thoughtful in what we've tried to, mm -hmm. to, to put out there. Um, and, and we have several big projects actually in the works, which are very specifically about diversity. So I'm, I'm excited that those will be, you know, of course that they're going to take a little longer to to put to, to put forth now to the public, but um, but yeah, it's it's something that we were already working on, which is which is great. But we still, like I said, have a long ways to go, and that and that's just the very tip of the iceberg, you know. Um, but the public art forum is something that is really uh, can have a, a real major impact because that's. You know, Desert X is great, but not everyone can make it out to the middle of Palm Springs to see those things. You know, where do you put art that, that the public can really see it? You know, it's got to be in the inner cities. It's got to be in places where, where everyone has access to it. That's the challenge. Well, I think that that's one of the things that came out of, you know, the civil unrest is that it was on the streets. It was in the neighborhoods. It was in different communities and it was representative and indicative of different voices. And it was more inclusive because it was the people that were out there protesting that were making and creating this art to take a stand. Yeah, yeah in, in some parts of, in some parts of, yeah, in some parts of Santa Monica uh, and Venice and LA, they're using um, art as a way to heal. So after some of the looting uh, while there were other people protesting, there were some groups who wanted to, uh, instead of going to protest, they were going to an art gathering where everyone's painting walls and sort of healing uh, through their display on, on, on all of the vacant walls that we have currently in, L in LA. So there is a way where people are using the public art to heal. Uh, and also just watching people draw their signs and sort of dolly up their own personal signage of what they're trying to get out to the public is, has been also interesting just watching and seeing and, and, and some people really put a lot of heart into it and they might not be artists. They're just people with emotions. And I think emotion drives a lot of art. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of a sort of a, a big shift uh, in the streets for public art and public awareness of the public art. I have a question. 
Are you guys um, having the same uh, fireworks uh, like explosions in on the West Coast as we are in New York City? Yeah, that's that's nationally, and that yeah. that's not going to stop for a while. Yeah, it's it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Hopefully, it would stop. Yeah. Uh, question, um, Gaston, I, I kind of want to start with you on this one, and then I also want to open this up to to everyone. This panel, as you look at us, we we talk about diversity. We are not very diverse. Um, di diversity is, is not easy to do. So as you look at the event moving forward, how do you approach, because we talk about the diversity in the work itself, how do you approach the idea of introducing diversity into an event like yours? And, and I want to I also say that it's also very, it's a, it's a touchy subject. And it has to be done. It has to be done deliberately and carefully, and with with not with proper tone and proper respect. How do you approach that? Well, I, I do believe that no. In, in that's a very good question. Um, but I do believe that no. We we always be that way uh, in terms of no offering no a very open platform for everybody. Uh, it's it's because no we. We curate, you know, all the pieces from all over the world. So, for example, um, it, it is part of our DNA to put the spotlight in good designers and, and given the opportunity for everybody. So now we're, and I'm sorry to speak a little bit more about another edition, but this is a perfect example. So we, in, in every edition, we um, award a designer of the year, which is a senior designer. Uh, we also. Uh, award six rising talents, and we choose you no know, different countries. For example, two years ago, we uh, we select uh, six rising talents from Lebanon, and probably you know you, you can see that okay, it, it is not part of the usual you know core to select you no know, rising talents from from Lebanon. And you can have many other countries, and we used to have you know from the U.S. in the last edition or Italy or U.K. and we choose Lebanon, and that is part of you no. Know, the diversity is like for us we show diversity through the pieces itself and and when you go deep you know through the pieces and you go to the story behind the pieces you will find the diversity it's not that we say okay we have to put the spotlight just only in a group of artists it's like no through the through the pieces you will see uh, that we are a very open and very diverse platform um, because it's not a matter of you no know, gender, culture, religion, color of your, it's, it's just only for, the, for the, the art itself or the design itself. Um, one question for you, as, as both Evan and Sandra were talking about, you know, the, the art in hospitality and art in public spaces and, and art, you know, being, being encouraged through the expression of clients and their work. Now we're seeing this, this purge of public statues across the country, across the world. It's not a new concept, but I can't recall a time when it's happened at, at this particular level. How do you view, you know, you have to take the political climate into in, in your mind when you're putting projects together and you do work on a, on a global scale. What do you see? How do you approach that? Wow. Uh, without getting into <laughs> politics, without, <laughs> without getting into politics, you know, um, one of the things we brought up was the, uh, the work by uh, Wiley of the proud black man, on a horse with his jeans and his hood and his sneakers, Rumors of, of War by Wiley, which was presented in October of 2019 before all of this was, was sort of being shaking up. But he made an impact to say that we should be commemorating important things, um, not things that were uh, of disgrace to certain, certain uh, people. 
And we're seeing more and more of these plazas, which were once uh, places for gathering uh, uh, where these statues resided all over the world are being torn down and toppled over. And, and they're noticing a lot of them are toppling over very easy uh, because it was, it was certain parts of the world, these movements were, were intended as part of, um, of a signage. Uh, they were not there as, as a hail to this person. They were signed specifically to uh, be implemented across the world. Um, again, those purposes are, are, are being toppled over right now. So the, 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 the language has been received and you can see the public responding in their own way that they don't feel as a, as a generation that, that some of these statues should be commemorated and should be held at a, at a, at a high level because the times have changed and, and, and um, our goal is, is uh, in viewing art in, in a plaza or in a space like that is how do you maintain uh, peace throughout the entire plaza. So how do you how do you curate spaces where you're not hurting someone's feelings, uh, which is very difficult. Uh, and I think that's where art is so uh, fun and, and diverse, where one one picture has meanings for everybody. So the curating movement ahead is just trying to look at history and, and making sure that we don't sort of make similar mistakes, if you can say there were mistakes. Um, in, in, in curating a plaza for the public space. It's different when it's a residential and it's private. It, it does change. When, you're, when you consider uh, public space art, it, it does take on a different um, sort of format and you, you look at that, that subject matter much different than a private. Um, and so we're running low on time and I wanted to end this with one question same question for each of you. It's very easy to focus on all of the things that are negative and all of the challenges that we have moving forward. I would like to know, and Wendy, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. What are you most optimistic about moving forward, specifically as it relates to the topic at hand, about how, how art, you know, we started out talking about art in nature, right? But I think art as a salve for society as something that that helps us express ourselves that helps us um, move forward in, in turbulent times and helps us communicate more effectively what are you most optimistic about moving well, I think, forward i think that i mean first of all i mean art art can change the world you know art can create conversation dialogue it can be representative of so many things and i think through this period of time that I think the amount of innovation and creativity that is happening on so many levels is really exciting. I think that there are people who are going to utilize this time, you know, positively and with optimism and look at, you know, you can't look at the past, you can't live in the present, you have to live in the present, you can't look at the future. So what are you going to do now? So rather than wasting the time to use it. So I think that there's so much innovation happening on every level within our business. And I think that it's brought to light, you know, through not only COVID, but the political situation right now across the globe, that there's gonna be some really outstanding, innovative new art to be seen everywhere from this. Sandra? Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about public art and these landmarks that uh, many of us would just walk right on past. And now they've taken on such iconic meaning it's an opportunity to empower everyone, really. And that is the positive message, is that art can be that language. Um, it's inclusive. And uh, you don't have to be an artist to be empowered by art. Interesting. Evan? Uh, I also see opportunities, uh, you know, whenever there's adversity, good change can come. And change is always good, whether it's difficult or not it's a good thing. And I think that this moment has forced all of us to rethink how we conduct business. And I think if that affects even just a fraction of the people in our world, in our industry, then real change will come. Um, so I, I think that that's exciting um, in many ways. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking, 
kind of, uh, I feel positive for the long-term uh, future of at least this movement that's, that's taken hold. Gaston? It's basically you no know, more of a well-known no, Michael Lee said. It's, um, I believe that this is a turning point, absolutely, and that it's, um, it, it is a moment to rethink things, you no, know, 360. And as Sandra says, now that, that involves us, all of us. It's not that you have to be a designer or an artist to understand or to be involved uh, in the creation or something in a, a, different, a different space. So I believe that you know, all of us in our particular industries are also you know, as a citizens, you know, with the cities, you, know, you have to be active uh, to rethink you know, the, the public art. Absolutely. Juan, final word on this? Oof. Thank you for um, that. A lot of things in these few months. And one of those uh, has been the lack of food supply that's available, uh, that could be readily available um, around our streets. Uh-oh, we lost around. It. There you go. I just think that there's an opportunity to somehow be able to develop a little bit more uh, edible fruits for citizens so that when you Okay, we, we totally lost your audio, uh, Juan. Sorry about that. But I, you know what? I do love what you ended that with. Um, and maybe art as, uh, as gardening as part, of, as part of the landscape art experience. Yeah, um, it has to be. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Your audio is back. So, uh, all I was saying, I, I see that there's a lack of connection between community, our streets, and, 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 and I'm, I'm thinking about how we can sort of create the infrastructure so that we do, if we do have these other dips of, of, of pandemics, we can sort of feed our, our public. Think about public plazas as well. I, I've just been seeing a lot of these um, protests going on in these, in these open spaces. And I, I look around and I, I just wish they were done a little bit differently, thinking about more of the user as a, as a whole to bring communities to talk. Um, so I want to, I think optimistic for me, for views would be to consider in my work, how do I address those, those issues, those weaknesses that I'm seeing, uh, both for the pandemic, uh, for, for the inequalities and, and how to engage our community and develop our community as well. So, I am going to be pushing a little bit more to help sort of bring the community a little bit closer and, and, and try to be involved more with the city, with where I live, and, and try to make sure that, that the elected officials I have in these cities can help supply and supplement both our art culture, our, 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 our environmental culture, and, and hopefully we, we can find room in plazas where we can meet to discuss issues amongst, uh, amongst uh, equal parts and be able to see art in the same respect while, while having conversations about new topics or new laws that we're going to try to acquire. So that's, that's the optimistic I see. I see a lot of changing for people wanting to, to, to socialize in public spaces to discuss politics as opposed to just being indoors. Uh, so I, I, I do see a lot going on in, in my city, at least, that I'd like to change. So Thank you. I think that's great. And Christine, I'm going to turn this back over to you in just a minute. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, this panel very much. Wendy, Sandra, Evan, uh, Gaston, Juan, thank you very much for doing this. Just a reminder, um, and Christine will tell you where you can find this in video, but we will also be publishing this to audio. The last thing I want to say, I want to thank you all very much for, for taking the time to join us today. And just remember that this isn't going to last forever. Um, Art is one of those things that, we, that will get us through. And between now and then, wear your mask. Christine, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Josh. That was an exquisite conversation. Thank you, everybody. That was wonderful. It was on point. It was political. It was very much of the times. And thank you all for being involved. It's a very prestigious group today. So much to think about and be hopeful for the future. I cannot wait to go live again and I know I'm not alone. Thank you Christine Anderson for organizing such a great event. Um, thank you Gaston, Sandra, Wendy, Juan, and Evan. Thank you Walker Zanger and Thermosol for your continued support and thank you for listening to the show. Without you there would be no Convo by Design. 
so thank you. Please make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss a single episode. You can find Convo by Design everywhere you get your favorite podcasts. You can also ask your smart device to play Convo by Design. Just say, hey, Siri, play Convo by Design podcast, and she will. If you want to continue the conversation, you can find us on uh, online at convobydesign.com or on Instagram at convobydesign with an X. Be well. And until next week, keep creating. 